Hi, this is Pat with Pat's Two Cents. We are God's Church of Love Online. And there are things that in life we must make room for. We must make room for his blessings. We must make room for the answered prayers we're waiting on. And we must make room for promotion for our destiny. My question to you is, are you preparing or are you napping? Are you getting ready, creating a space, creating a space in time? Or are you sitting there doing whatever because you have no aim? The Bible says the people perish for lack of of a vision because they have no vision the people perish so um that's a paraphrase not a direct quote so understand that you have to have a focus if you are shooting a bow and arrow i gotta make a little example so you understand what i mean if you're shooting a bow and arrow and you pull that string back and that arrow is is attached and you let it go you have to you can't just shoot in the wind you have to have a target. So what you do is you set up the target way over in the distance, or you determine what is your target. You have to determine a target in your life. You may have five or six targets, but there's that one main target. And the bottom line is you have to aim. But before you can shoot the arrow, you got to get the arrow in your hand. And you have to get the bow in your hand. And you put them in the right position, hold your arm correctly, pull back, aim, and let go. Then I'm going to tell you, the higher you aim, the higher you land. The higher you aim, the higher that, the further that arrow will go. At a certain angle, you have to aim high. Not straight up, I'm talking out. You have to aim high. So. Okay, my point in saying that, I'm going to read the scripture. My point in saying that, God has callings and elections in our lives. He not only has that, he has blessings waiting in the wings. Remember I told you every time I dream about a car, I get one. Every single time. What I want to share with you is how to make room for your blessings how to make room for answered prayers, and how to aim as you pursue and prepare for your calling. Now, I'm, I'll be 70 years old in July. And what I want to share with you is I'm going to school because I am not satisfied with a life of retirement, free time, and a haphazard schedule. I want my life to count for something. I'm not going to do five or 10 different things all at once because I'll do nothing effectively. So right now, where is my aim? Where is my focus? School. That's my top priority right now. Why? Because God is my number one priority and he is the reason I'm going to school. The other reason is because God called me to the ministry with Isaiah 61. So I am equipping myself as much as I can. I am exercising and stirring up the gift that God has given me. And if I don't do anything with the gift, the gift will never be developed. So sometimes you have to take a little time and ask God to let you know what is your divine calling. You know your giftings, you can pretty much tell. But what is your divine calling? And then you make yourself available to him. But don't be a busy little bee that's doing so much nothing gets done. You want to make sure that you focus. All right, let's go to uh, Hebrew. No, let me see. Yeah, let's go to Hebrew chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. 
Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Now, let's shoot on down to this one. This one got me. Okay. Verse 24, starting at verse 24. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, which means he gave up his riches, y'all. He gave up his wealth. He gave up his royalty. I mean, everything from the king's palace, he gave up all the trappings of abundance. Now listen, 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who was invisible. Through faith, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he that destroyed the firstborn should touch him. By faith, this is the part that grabbed me when I was reading this. They passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, which the Egyptians are saying to do were drowned. Now, the thing that, see, we get intimidated. We're either running around chasing our tail or running around handling this, handling that, putting out this fire, putting out that fire, running to this one's rescue, running to that one's rescue. And we're just running. We're, we're, we're like the, uh, Ah, we're like the road running. Beep, beep, thrurr, beep, beep, thrurr, beep, beep, thrurr. And there's no focal point. There's no target in front of us. We're just running around, just, just flitting around like a fly. A fly has no aim other than, you know, what flies do. So sometimes what we have to do is be still and say, okay, Lord, order my steps. Order my steps. You don't want to become a Martha. You remember the story where Martha and Mary were getting things ready? And Martha was upset and told Jesus, tell her to get up and help me. I'm trying to get ready for the banquet. And she's sitting up there at your feet. She's not doing anything. And Jesus said, poor baby. I'm putting in my words, poor baby, you're so busy trying to get things done. But Mary has chosen the better part. Mary is focused. Mary is gleaning from me. The banquet can wait. I am here. Think about that. Think about how much time we utilize that could have gone to God. I'm, I'm guilty of it too. I have to really start pulling in the reins and, and chipping away at things that keep me distracted so that I can start focusing more on God. All of us have to, we have to pull in our reins. It's easy to get so caught up in five, six, seven, eight, nine things before you know it, God is squeezed out. And then he's sitting up there saying, I miss my time with you. <laughs> Those moments together. I need to be with you each day. But it hurts me when you say you're too busy. Busy? Trying to please me. <laughs> or trying to serve me. Mm. See, that is what ends up happening. So let's not lose track of our connection with God while we're trying to do for him. Like Martha was trying to do, do, do. And Mary chose the better part. Some things you may have to do without doing. <laughs> some things you may have to lay aside, some activities, 
some time you have to position for God and not answer the phone. Somebody calls you in the middle of prayer. What are you doing answering the phone? Mm, never thought of that one, did you? If you're sitting in your office with your boss and or your supervisor and they call you in and they need to have a 30-minute conference with you, are you going to be ring, ring? Oh, uh, just a minute. Hold that finger up. Oh, uh, just a minute, boss. Uh, yeah, yeah. What's up? What's up? What do you need? You're not going to do that with your boss. So why do it with God? Why are you running out of the church building to answer a phone call or a text? That could wait until service is over. Think about that. When, I, when I'm in class or I'm in church, I'm not running around answering phone calls. That's during chat time, but not during the time when we're worshiping or having a, the word. Or It's something, I don't know what it is about this day and age. But that's one of the things I don't like about the cell phones. I don't like about technology the way it is now. This right here, this ends up being your all in all. The, I'm holding up a cell phone for those of you who can't see me. The cell phone comes with you to the bathroom. The cell phone comes with you to the store. The cell phone sits with you in the car. The cell phone sits right next to the Bible. The cell phone, everywhere you go, that cell phone is there. But there are times when you are going to set aside for God. So this is about relationship with God. And it's about hearing from him. And then working and preparing space for the blessings he's bringing. Because he will give you a heads up. If you're taking the time to listen, if you have an ear to hear, Jesus said, my people know my voice. Do you know Jesus's voice or are you quicker to recognize when your cell phone is buzzing? Hmm. Which one gets answered first, God or the cell phone? <laughs> We're living in that kind of society now. Technology comes first. You may be preaching, or you may be singing, or you may be doing praise and worship, but somebody's somebody just texted me. I got to go outside and see what this is about. Why? What happened during the times when we didn't have cell phones? Why are you so easily distracted now? Why are you so easily pulled off course? Think about that. It's a strategy. Satan is the prince of the air. Think of that. Mm. So be careful about putting so much priority on that little black box right there, on that little black device. Be careful about that. When I remembered years ago, people, there was more respect for the word of God. There was more respect for praise and worship. And when things were going on, the only ones that would be jumping up and down are the ones that were only there just to socialize. But the folks that were serious about God, really wanted to hear from God, they wanted to sit up front. So they weren't in the back where all the distractions were. Where is your position? God wants to tell you something. Are you positioning yourself to hear from him? Are you interested in what he has to say? Or are you more excited when your phone goes off and somebody's trying to reach you? Are you interested in what God wants you to do? Or are you more interested in somebody needing you to do them a favor? And why? That's what you have to ask yourself. Now, when you deal with the, the book of, of Hebrews and you're dealing with faith, when you are 
trying to have an ear to hear what God is saying to you as an individual. You get a feeling of the plans he has for you. You get a feeling that something's stirring when he's ready to tell you what your calling is. You get a feeling it's time to get married. It's time to buy a house. It's time to start my own business. It's time to get rid of this car and get that car because God's going to have me on the road doing this, that, or the other. God's going to give me a promotion, so I need to prepare. I need to study. I have to gather information, gather knowledge, learn certain things. So when it's time for him to put me in that position, I'm not all thumbs calling 10 people to help me do what one person ought to be able to do. Are you preparing yourself? Are you listening for the Lord? Do you have enough faith to believe that God will get you there? And are you doing what it takes to free yourself up so he can put you in that position and get you to your destination? You will never get to the store. Let's say the store is your destination for the day and, or this afternoon, and you have to go buy some eggs or you have to go uh, buy some this, that, or the other toilet paper, some, some basic necessity, but you got, you know where you got to go to get it. Are you going to get to the store sitting on your little rumpskins thinking about it? Hmm? You have to make preparations. This is so basic y'all, but it, it's when you think about getting ready for what God has for you, it's profound. You have to get clothes on your back. You can't walk out buck naked. You can't go out there in your pajamas. You can, but well, okay. So you get to the store. Now you got to get in your car, you get in on your bike, you walk, whatever, but you got to make a way to get you from point A to point B. And once you get there, you got to make sure you have your wallet, your card, your money, whatever, so you can pay for the items you need to bring home. Whatever you do, you have to make preparation. You need to go back and forth to work. You have to put gas in your car. Keep it gassed up. Keep air in your tire. Maintain your car. There are things you have to do, basic necessities. But why is it when it comes to the things of God, we approach that with a haphazard attitude? Oh, yeah, well, you know, I'll let somebody else help me with that. Oh, uh, I, I'm not interested in that. But God wants to position you over here to minister or teach a group of people. And you don't even know how to turn the computer on. You got to do it online, but you don't know how to do this, that, or the other. And you're not calling people in advance. You're not watching how-to videos in advance. You're not teaching yourself. You're not getting tutored. You're not going to a computer store and having them walk you through. You wait till it's time to be there and you're, uh, you're ill-equipped. You're not prepared. You're not ready. You don't have the knowledge you need because you didn't focus on the vision. Why? You let life have you distracted and you're scattered and haphazard. You're all over the place. But that thing and those students suffer because you don't have your craft lined up. You're not ready to carry out your craft efficiently. You may have gone to school and gotten the title, but now that you got a job, you're not equipped to carry out your job because you did not sit down, humble yourself, take time out of your busy schedule and prepare. See, <laughs> We think because we lived a long time, been there, done that, been there, done that, been there, done that, that we're fully equipped. No, you're not. All right. Now, this is, to me, a picture of society, the systems and the powers that be. The way the system is laid out, it is meant to keep you so busy, you don't even have time for your own family. 
You don't have time for yourself, let alone God. All right, this is what I want to share with you. Um, And there's a reason for it, and this exposes it right here. Starting with, this is Acts chapter 16, verse 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us which brought her masters much gain by sooth saying. The same followed Paul and us and cried saying, these men are the servants of the most high God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. And when her masters, verse 19 is the key one right here. When her masters saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace into the rulers, unto the rulers, and brought them to the magistrates saying, these men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. Now I'm going to stop right now, right there, because the point is, when they saw that their pockets were going to be threatened, that's when they rose up against the men, the the disciples of God. Listen to this, you. Listen, please listen. When you look at how this society is lined up now, when you look at how things are set up to keep us busy, 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 if you look at my eyes right now, all right, if I want to focus on something, but somebody calls me and I pick up the phone and somebody over here needs this and I, I look over there and I'm looking, 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 you notice my eyes are off of the monitor. I'm all over the place. My eyes are down. Oh, what's going on over here? Oh, you need me? Okay, I'll be right back. And I mean, I'm just all over the place. <laughs> what I'm doing will never get done effectively because I'm too busy being drawn away. That is a real strategy of Satan. He doesn't mind you serving God. He'll have you so busy that, that, that you don't even, that, he'll have you so busy you're getting dizzy. That's about the best way for me to say it. Yeah, he'll keep you dizzy with busyness. When too much is going on, you burn out the candle at both ends. You set yourself up for sickness. You set just your body up for problems. And Satan wants a life of stress. He wants to keep people so inundated. See, when you're so busy doing things, you can't master what God has you aiming at because you haven't taken the time to find out what he's got you to look at. Now, you don't have to go to school to prepare for what God has for you. God's timing will kind of guide you into where you need to go. When it's time, he'll tell you. Let me share a few quick stories to let you know how God will guide and lead. One day, I felt an extreme dissatisfaction with my condition in the workplace. And I leaned up against my dining room table and I asked the Lord, if I were to ask you if I should go to school, what would you tell me to take? Because I want to be self-employed. I want to be able to get up when I want to get up. I want to be able to go to work when I want to go to work. I want to be able to get paid what I deem I'm worth. I want to have the freedom. If I need a day off, I can take that day off. If I need to do this for somebody, I can be available. But I want to be in control of my schedule. I want to be in control of my pay. And I want to be in control of my time. So I'm asking you to guide my steps. I'm asking you to tell me, should I go back to school? What should I do 
to position myself to have control over my schedule and the way that I spend my time working. What shall I do? What step shall I take? What move shall I make? Oh Lord, what shall I do? And I was getting the school thing in my spirit. And I said, okay, if you want me to go to school, what would you tell me to major in? Now, let me share this with you. In my heart, because I'm an artist, I wanted to see the Lord tell me, go to school and take graphic arts in the name of Jesus. I wanted the Lord to tell me what I wanted to hear. The Lord put a sign in midair. I saw a vision of a sign. That was my answer. And across the, the ceiling in an arch was C-O-S-M-E-T-O-L-O-G-Y. Cosmetology? Ah, what? Uh, that was not what I had in mind. But that's what God told me to do. So what did I do as a result? I positioned myself to be able to work in the field of cosmetology by going to school and taking cosmetology. I applied myself and that class had top priority over all my life because it was an eight hour a day, 40 hour a week class. And as soon as we left class, instead of me going home or running errands, I went across the street with an Armenian student and a Latino student. And we sat down there and rehashed all that homework because they had English as a second language. So it was a challenge to them. And me helping them and all of us doing our homework together made everything easy for me when it was time to take those tests. It drilled it in my head, trying to help them. So that school occupied my time, not errands, not busyness, that school. And when it was time to go and get my license, I had to drive down to Wilshire. I had to position myself at the appointed time, take that test pass the test, get that license in my hand. Then the next step was, Lord, where do you want me to work? One lady walks up to me in church, says, congratulations on your, on your uh, license. I work at a hair salon and the owner is, is a Christian. Would you like to work there? I'll give you her number. You can give her a call. I didn't know where to go. And I worked at that shop for 13 years. So my point is God will guide you, but you got to take the first step. If he says, do this, you got to do this before you can go over there and do that. It's not time to do that yet. You have to go in increments. He will take you step by step, direction by direction, appointment by appointment. He'll get you there. But you have to be focused on listening to him. When your life has no real direction, you can wear yourself out. But once you get God's vision for your life, at that point in time, listen, God's vision for you in your 20s might be totally different than his vision for you in your 30s. So seek him at every given moment. Because your change may come drastically and you may not know what to do. When Milton and I were in Altadena, there was nothing in me that thought I would move out of Altadena for any reason. But here I am, an hour and a half away. Why? Because God positioned circumstances and started getting my attention. And I sought him and sought him and sought him. And now I'm living in a house I own. 
on a fixed income, $1,067 a month. I own a two-story house in a senior gated community. How did that happen? God led every step of the way. Had I been too busy, had I been too occupied, had I been too, too, too fragmented, this may never have happened for me because I wouldn't have heard. You got to slow your roll, y'all. You got to slow your roll. God has things he has for you. You have desires in your heart you don't even talk about. God knows those desires. But are you seeking him? Or are you just throwing it up in the wind? Oh, well, you know, you know, you know God will have his way. No, you, the more, listen to this, the more specific your prayers are, the more specific your requests are, the more specific his answers will be. I ask God for a two-story house with a balcony outside of my bedroom. Yes, I did. I wanted Milton to have access to a hot tub and me to have access to a pool. I uh, <laughs> itemized exactly what I wanted when I put my prayer request before the Lord. Do you understand? I was telling my friend last night when the Lord let me know, yes, he's going to give you that new car you dreamt about X amount of years ago. But first, he wants you to buy a used car pointing out of the lot, which told me when I woke up, I need to buy my car, my used car from a dealership to establish credit. So what did I do? I sat there and said, Lord, this is what I want. And you know, with used cars, you can't be picky. You get what they got. But I knew God could get it there. So I said, Lord, wherever you want me to go, I want burgundy on the outside, tan leather on the inside. And I itemized everything to the Lord, not the dealership. All the dealership knew when I went was I want a, I wanted an eight-cylinder engine. And I wanted something that can accommodate a wide bottom and long legs for my husband. That was all I said. Four-door sedan. That was it. The man took me right to a Buick Roadmaster, burgundy on the outside, tan leather on the inside. With all the specs, I told the Lord I wanted. See, when you are, God is ready to do something in your life. That's what I'm getting. He's getting ready to do something in your life, but he needs your undivided attention. And if you're flitting over here and flitting over there and doing this and doing that and busy, 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 you're going to miss. It's like listening to a uh, radio loaded with static or trying to talk to somebody on a cell phone and you have a bad connection because of the area you're in. You're talking and it's just something and you miss something. So you have to know when God is talking to you. You have to know when he's getting your attention. And you have to know that there is something required of you to prepare yourself for the blessing. When the Lord gave me the dream, remember I said car dreams always come true for me. When the Lord gave me a dream that I woke up in a different car, and I'm driving a, a, a car that someone gave me, but I wake up in a different car. And I said, well, that means I got to sell this car because God's going to give me another car. I got to sell this car and I've got to clear out my garage to make room for that car because that's a bigger car. I knew what kind of car it was because I dreamt about it. I was like, oh, you gave me my car back. So what happened? I cleared out and I made room and I sold the car. Now, for 13 days, I am without a car. And one of my friends thought I was cuckoo for doing it. But I did it by faith. I knew what God was telling me. So what happened? 13 days later, the Lord blessed me with that car. And I rolled it up in my garage and had plenty room for it. I was ready for it because I cleared it out. 
to make room for the blessing. What is God trying to get you to focus in on right now? What is God positioning himself to get your attention to do, to position yourself to receive what he has waiting in the wings for you? It's time to ask that question, isn't it? Yeah, it's time to seek. And there may be some familiar things, like with Moses, that you may have to walk away from before those, those blessings start coming to you. Because the Israelites were not going to get their blessing on the other side of that sea. They had to cross over dry land with a wall of water on both sides. And you know, for some of you who've been to New York and you've stood in Manhattan with all those tall skyscrapers, you could almost get dizzy looking at them come to a peak in the sky because they're so high. Imagine how high the wall of water was. Imagine that. How scary. We don't let that water break loose. Hold it, Lord. Hold it. <laughs> Imagine how scary that was to walk through a wall of water. But listen, they had to do that in order to be on the side and in the position where they can get the blessing from God. That's what this is talking about when it said Moses. He took those people across on dry land. Had any of them decided to stay on the other side? No, nah, I don't know what's over there. I know what's over here. We get the dry, you know, we get the leeks and the garlic over here. You know, we may get our booty whooped and, and we may be oppressed and life might be almost pure hell over here. But guess what? At least I know what's happening over here. I don't know what's over there. But God is leading you over there and you won't go. Why? What are you afraid of when God's the one in control of your life? I'm leaving you with that question right there. Amen?